A very warm welcome to all of you to this side event on Indigenous Peoples' Rights and Development on the Ground, Emerging Findings from the Indigenous Navigator Initiative. Mm -hmm. And we're just having people coming in and joining us. That's great. My name is Julia Koch, and I'm the Executive Director of EUGIA. Uh, and before I start introducing the speakers, I just want to just quickly um, tell you those of you who don't know what the Navigator Initiative is about. But first of all, I just need to uh, say a few logistics that we have interpretations here. So if you need French, that will be channel one, Spanish, channel three, and English, channel five. So the Navigator Initiative is a collaborative initiative between AIPP, FPP, Teptepe, the Danish Institute of Human Rights, ILO, UGIA, and our funder, the EU. And the main purpose of the initiative is to empower indigenous peoples to monitor and advocate for their rights. And within the Navigator Initiative or framework, there are various many elements. Um, a very basic or core to the initiative is that in indicators for monitoring indigenous people's rights has been have been developed based on key instruments, primarily the UNDRIP and the ILO Convention, as well as SDG targets and indicators. We have done surveys in 11 countries around the world and in more than 200 communities. So based on the indicators, we've developed questionnaires and surveys have been done at the community level and national level. We've done analysis, reports, fact sheets have been developed, and various uh, advocate, advocacy initiatives have taken place. And tied to all this, um, we have approximately, or will have approximately 60 small innovative projects in the 11 countries. So what the purpose of this event is to take stock of where we are in this initiative that has all these many components I just very quickly outlined. So data has been collected, some data has been analyzed, small projects, innovative projects are being initiated and various advocacy initiatives are already taking place. And the question we would like to debate here today is, so di what difference will that make? So today what we will have is we will have a global overview uh, of what the picture looks like now, and then we will hear from three country experiences, Bangladesh, the Philippines, Kenya, and Peru. So with me today, I have Joanne Carling from the Indigenous Peoples Major Group. I have Palap Chakma from the Kapeng Foundation in Bangladesh. Robbie Halep from Teptepe Foundation Philippines. Kimaran on the far side. Kimaran Riamat from Ilepa in Kenya, and then Shapion Noningo from the Territorial Autonomous Government of the One Piece Nation in Peru. And then later we will have closing remarks from Tovo Sonde, the European External Action Service, who sits over here, come up later, and Martin Olds from the ILO, who is also around. Before we start talking, uh, before Joanne is going to give us a global overview of where we are, we're just going to see a short film that I think really illustrates very well some of the challenges that indigenous peoples are experiencing. So will we have the film on? Yes, we will. Almost 370 million people around 90 countries belong to the indigenous peoples. They represent humanity in all its diversity. And they all have in common the fact that they are the most excluded, discriminated, threatened, and often poorest communities worldwide.
somos lo peor engañados en este milenio que estamos. El recuerdo Caño Mochuelo está ubicado en el nororiente del departamento de Casanare, eh, con 10 pueblos ancestrales y con 14 comunidades. El gobierno no ha querido reconocer que somos pueblos ancestrales, que nosotros también sufrimos y que somos Colombia y que hacemos parte de Colombia. No existimos para el Estado, porque acá nos arrinconaron, acá nos acorralaron. Nos trata todavía como salvaje, sabiendo que hay una norma, hay una ley que tiene el Estado para que nosotros seamos atendidos como pueblos indígenas y pueblos vulnerables de muchas necesidades. Entonces, ¿cómo podríamos y a dónde podríamos acudir? Ya que Colombia, como Colombia, no quiere escuchar lo que nosotros vivimos y lo que nosotros sentimos y lo que nosotros estamos sufriendo, nuestros niños, para de aquí a mañana puedan vivir como vive un colombiano en el país. ตัดรัฐบาลไทยไม่ยอมรับคําว่าชนเผ่าพื้นเมืองมีในประเทศไทยเพราะว่าเขาเรียกผู้รับว่าเป็นชาวเก่าเราพิจารณาดูแลในเชิงนโยบายในเชิงกับปฏิบัติในเชิงการสนับสนุนเชิงนโยบายที่ทําให้เกิดความแตกต่างในเรื่องชนชั้นและความเป็นยุติธรร
So lack of recognition, discrimination. Um, I will now give the word to Joanne. Joanne will give us an overview of, of what some of our data um, shows and reflect on, on some of these issues. Okay, um, good afternoon to everyone. I have a brief PowerPoint to, to show where we are now in the in, the, in this initiative uh, in monitoring human rights uh, and SDGs of indigenous peoples. So this is just to show the, the framework and the key tools that we're using. So it, on, on, if you see here, these are the instruments that we are using and from the UN Declaration on Human Rights Instruments and the SDGs, key attributes were identified that relates to the key human rights of indigenous peoples and based on that indicators, were developed and from indicators, uh, questions uh, for community level and at the national level were uh, defined to capture the, the situation of uh, human rights of indigenous people. So these are the tools. Now, uh, these, are the, these tools are used for first community-based monitoring, what's the reality on the ground. Uh, and it's it's the people themselves that 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 uh, that defines it. So it's a community questionnaire to get information directly from uh, the communities to to say how their rights are being respected, violated, or are they able to exercise. Then uh, uh, we also include indicators on the SDGs on the uh, 2030 Development Agenda. If if, if communities are actually being part or are their rights and their inclusion for development uh, is uh, uh, done by, by states and other actors. And finally also that, uh, uh, their local, the, that these communities based on the, on the data that they have are able to come out with their own local development plans. Uh, so it's a proactive, it's not just responding to human rights violations, but this data is also used by the communities to uh, make their own plan to address their needs and aspirations. And um, so as, as mentioned, uh, the areas are uh, in 11 countries, and these are uh, Bolivia, Colombia, Peru, Suriname, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Nepal, Philippines, Cameroon, Kenya and Tanzania. So it's across three regions of indigenous peoples. Now, where are we in terms of the data that we have gathered? Oh, can you? Sorry, there. Uh, so this is the map where the countries are, the, what we call the pilot countries. So in terms of the community surveys, there, there's already 134. Uh, community surveys, meaning uh, data were collected directly from community members in 134 communities across the 11 countries. Next. So, uh, so this one shows the 134 and uh, it's, uh, it's already in the data portal. 86% uh, are already put in the data portal. And it, the, the, the community surveys uh, cover uh, more than 250,000 indigenous uh, peoples and representing more than 200 indigenous uh, communities across the world. Now this is an example of the, of the, uh, the collection of, of uh, community data and explaining the indigenous navigator initiative just to show the face. <laughs> Now the national surveys, uh, and the national surveys include the legal framework, is there recognition of rights at the national level, or what, are, the, what are, are there programs addressing indigenous peoples? So this survey is already completed. Uh, the, the last one is just under review for uploading in the, in the data portal. So meaning the, the situation uh, at the national level uh, when it comes to uh, to structural information, uh, data is already there, uh, particularly in relation to, to laws and policies uh, relating to indigenous uh, peoples. Uh, now, this is just an example to show uh, if there are gaps, 
if you compare the national data, the information like, like for example, are, are uh, land rights recognized at the national level? Then at the community level, what are the communities saying? Are there, are they, are their land protected or not? So if you look at the, 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 the what, what we call the uh, key, key areas, you can see that it actually covers uh, a lot of indigenous um, concerns. It, 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 it's it's a, a comprehensive one. So you have on health, education, access to justice, fundamental rights and free, freedoms, yeah? So these are the dimensions that we cover from both national and community survey. And you can see the difference. Uh, like for example, the, the brown, can you see the brown line? The brown line is the national one. And the blue line is the community. So from, from this, uh, you can say that the, the national law uh, provides for recognition of identity and participation in public life. That's what's in the law. But from the community survey, there's a, a gap, right? Uh, th there's, there's still participation, but not a full participation. What's also interesting is in terms of language, the national law does not provide recognition. But at the community level, they're able still to, to, uh, to speak their own language. So that means at the community level, regardless of the law, when it comes to their rights, they persist, they continue to exercise their rights. So this is just an illustration on how we, we identify the gaps uh, from what the national uh, legal uh, system is saying to what the experience at the community level. Okay, now uh, from the data, you can, this is an, uh, an, uh, another example that from the community questionnaire, it clearly shows that uh, the indigenous peoples in Cameroon are poor across all the communities. This is, uh, this demo so this is an evidence to show that the people themselves are saying they are poor. It's not us telling them, they are the ones uh, saying that they are poor because of lack of access to employment, to education, to health. That, that, uh, uh, that defines uh, why they claim they are, they are poor. So, uh, oh, sorry, I'm getting confused using mine and that. Okay, <laughs> move on. Now, another interesting data that came out uh, from, from the results is uh, on, on the use of of indigenous languages. Uh, because this year is declared as the year of indigenous language. Now, uh, at the national level, this, these are the, uh, uh, the, the questions uh, uh, in, the, in the questionnaire, no? Are indigenous languages used in systems of signposting, documentation, and official communications? And this was the response. Yes, it's only 37%. Uh, and 62% majority uh, uh, says that their, national, uh, their indigenous language are not actually being used. Okay, next, this one is in relation to how communities perceive the, the condition of their language. So you can see that many communities say that, that uh, their, their language is under threat or there, 12.6% says critically endangered, their language, no? While 24% says it's uh, safe in the sense that there's still many of them that are speaking the language uh, from all generations. So this is an example where we can use the data you know, to capture certain uh, rights of indigenous peoples on how far they are being recognized and how far they are being protected or exercised on the ground. So uh, no, uh, as from the data that was gathered, uh, these are the, the, the uh, use, no? that it's being used now on how do we communicate, because we don't gather data for data's sake. Yeah? The reason is we want to use this to advocate and draw attention to the conditions of indigenous peoples. So national fact sheets were, are already uh, out there, published. The, the national fact sheets 
include data on the statistics, the population, socioeconomic conditions of, of indigenous people. So that, that provides a, a glimpse on, on, on the situation uh, of indigenous peoples uh, in the pilot countries. Next. Then the data is also used actively for advocacy activities. Uh, many are actually in relation to SDGs, as, as you know that the SDGs is now uh, uh, in the process of implementation. So in, in Colombia, for example, they're using the, the, uh, the, the report uh, on the status of uh, indigenous peoples and SDGs to present uh, to the government what are their needs and aspirations that should be included in the SDGs. And we're, uh, we're using the pledge of leaving no one behind as, a, as, a, as an entry point to push, look, indigenous people's rights are being violated and, uh, and, you know, we're, and this is an, a factor why uh, we are not included. You see, so that, that's just to explain. Then in, in, in Nepal, they actually developed a five-year development plan and, they're not, and they have submitted that that should be included in the SDG plan of the national uh, government. And the plan was based on the expressed needs and conditions of indigenous peoples as per the data that was gathered. What's interesting is that communities, they, when they respond to the data, I to the questionnaire, and when you send back the response, they're actually surprised when you show that, oh, then they realize that you know, the situation when it's showed to them is, re is bad, that, that, that they never realized. For example, some communities, they actually don't know that they have rights on their lands. And, and in, so in the process of the data gathering, they actually realize that they actually have rights and that, and that uh, the violations are taking place without them knowing it. So by... Uh, but now with that knowledge and the data that they have, they now use it as an advocacy tool. So, um, so uh, also, in, 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 uh, this is exactly the case, the one I'm explaining to you in, in, in Cambodia, where they are now using uh, the data to present what are their needs and priorities uh, in line with the IP development framework in Cambodia. This is a positive thing because the Cambodia uh, government decided to uh, have an IP development framework and they're now engaging with indigenous peoples. Now also in the process of the SDGs, I don't know if you have heard what's called the voluntary national reviews, where countries report on how they are implementing the SDGs. And for this year, Cambodia and other countries are going to report. So, uh, so the data is going to be used uh, to, to show the realities on the ground and how indigenous peoples can be incorporated. Yeah? Okay, and these are the other uh, ad advocacy activities from you know, having negotiations and dialogue with local governments, go doing outreach to, to media to present their situation, um, and among others. Next. Uh, now, the other interesting component is the community development plan, as already mentioned by Julie. Since communities are also going to develop their own plans, and what we have now is that there are 18 uh, co uh, community initiatives that has been approved for funding, and at least 20 communities are using their community plans to, uh, to have dialogue with governments and others to, to afford these plans to be supported. And for the overall, uh, there will be 66 communities that will receive uh, funds to, uh, for their community plans. Now the other, the, the wider picture now is to show another uh, uh, <laughs> data is that uh, the National Action Plan for Implementation of the UN Declaration was a commitment made by governments under the world, the outcome document of the World Conference of Indigenous Peoples. So far, not a single government has come out with that plan. Uh, next. And uh, the, also breaching the, the use of these tools by national human rights institutions. There's already 27 national in, uh, human rights institutions across three regions that are trained on the, on the navigator and are very much keen to use the navigator, including that to, uh, the, the, the result in taking action to protect the rights of indigenous peoples. Next. Uh, 
Now, what's interesting is that a lot of people don't know that actually a lot of the SDG goals and targets are linked to human rights. And this one demonstrates that those links. Uh, for example, in the UPR, uh, you can see that uh, this, these are the targets in the, in, in the SDGs. And based on these targets, these are the recommendations relating to these targets made on indigenous peoples. There's so many recommendations for example, telling governments that they should respect and protect land rights of indigenous peoples, that they should implement free, prior, and informed consent for projects uh, by business corporations. Uh, they, they, uh, they should develop appropriate health uh, programs for indigenous peoples. So these are human rights, right? The UPR is, is the body that evaluates how governments are performing their human rights obligations. And these are the legally binding human rights instruments. So you can see uh, the, that it's uh, the, the link um, between the, the human rights and the SDGs as it pertains to indigenous peoples. Next. So uh, this shows in the pilot countries the recommendations made uh, to indigenous uh, peoples uh, in the protection of the rights of indigenous peoples. So there's so many that uh, uh, what we all need now is just for government to implement this so that we are not left behind in the SDGs. Next. So this also shows for the particular goals, these are the recommendations no, from the pilot, uh, uh, pilot countries. If you notice, Goal 16 has the biggest recommendation, and this deals with the issue of discrimination, access to, access to justice, peace, and strong institutions. And that reflects the kind of situation that we're facing, and that the, hum that the, the UN is actually responding, but there's still lack of implementation. Okay, next. Oh, okay, that's it. <laughs> Thank Sorry. you so much, Joanne. <laughs> We have four country presentations to go through, so I'm just going to jump straight to the next one, to you, Palad. Um, you're going to show us what it looks like in Bangladesh and how the indigenous navigator has been, I hope, of some use there. Uh, okay. Uh, we are grateful that on the, in Bangladesh, we are implementing indigenous navigator project with ILO and so far we are having very good experience as the ILO national project coordinator, he himself is an indigenous, that's why coordination among us is superb. And next please. This is the ethnic composition of Bangladesh and so far government recognized 50 indigenous groups but according to the government language it is ethnic minorities. So, and among the 50 indigenous groups, during our uh, data gathering week, uh, we conducted the, the community data gathering in 25 communities from across the country. And you can, next please. Yeah. There are officially 1.2 million indigenous people, but uh, we indigenous people believe that it is more, it, it will be, the total population is more than 3 million. And also, yes. Already recognized by Bangladesh government, 15 indigenous communities, and most of the uh, the, the concentration, most uh, concentration of indigenous people are in Chittagong Hills, but there are many pockets in plain land where indigenous people also live in the plain land. And Bangladesh is one of the countries that ratify ILO Convention 107, and now we are encouraging and advocating to Bangladesh government so that they come forward to ratify the ILO Convention 169. And for this, uh, here just one uh, poverty ratio, if we compare here, the national poverty ra ratio is 23.2, whereas the indigenous people's poverty ratio is 70.8, 70 to 80%. And for this project, from the Bangladesh government perspective, the Ministry of Chittagong Hitchcock is the focal ministry. And next, please. Uh, we conducted the community that are from uh, 25 communities and we covered 486 individuals. 
and space. Now, uh, I would like to share about some of the findings on education and also uh, employment. So, less than half of the indigenous children seem to attend organized learning and preschool before they start uh, attending primary school. For the boys, this is 40%. 25% report respondents say that none of the boys from the indigenous communities attend such uh, organized learning sessions. Uh, as for girls, the ratio is 36%, while a similar 24% respondents say that no girls from the indigenous communities attend preschool. However, majority, if not the most of the children, do seem to attend primary school as for the replies of the respondents from the community that are gathering. Next, please. This is, uh, the, though, a considerable percent of drop out in secondary school. Uh, here from the, from the table, we can see that two out of five boys uh, drop out rate is 36%. And, Whereas the girls, one out of five double grade is 36 percent. Similarly, there are also very few where it seems to be complete the, the complete the tertiary level of education. Another significant findings from the community data: there is an alarming level of inability of the indigenous children and young people to read and write in their mother tongue. That, con that continues all the way from preschool to lower secondary level. Why? 92% of the indigenous children are incapable of reading in their own indigenous languages. The percentage still persists uh, at 88% at the lower secondary level. This is also reflected in the subsequent question during the uh, data gathering, where, whereby 92% say that all Classes in primary school are taught in non-indigenous languages, presumably Bengali, which is the national media of instruction in school. Uh, now about the accessibility of the school, less than half of the indigenous children have schools within an accessible areas. And during the data gathering, we also considered the government uh, schools, government primary schools. Uh, the culture, traditions, and heritage of indigenous people is, is little reflected in a positive manner in the primary school curricula. 54% of the respondents uh, felt that the, these not at all reflected, whereas 44% thought that this is the case only to limited extent. Uh, because previously there were sub derogatory and other, some uh, information about the indigenous people in the national curricula. So this was, uh, uh, we communicated with the national board of curricula and uh, accordingly they have corrected some of, some of the textbooks. In terms of uh, employment, an overwhelming percentage of the indigenous people's communities contribute, continue their traditional occupations. In the, in the response of the question, can your community perform their traditional occupations? They responded, the community responded that to a limited extent is 56%, to some extent 20%, and to considerable uh, extent is 16%. It is Nevertheless, clear that traditional occupation of the indigenous people's communities are receding, and evidence of the rapid socioeconomic and cultural changes that these communities are currently going through. It is also revealing from the fact that most of the young people seems no more engaged in vocational education, training, or employment, meaning that vast majority of them are unemployed or are search of employment and these and those who have very few of them are employed in formal sector such as uh, they have jobs with normal work hours and regular ways that are recognized as income sources 
on which income taxes must be paid. Consequently, there is significant level of out-migration. Uh, although it is more noticeable for seasonal out-migration and particularly for the young men, there is equally an alarming high percentage of child labor in the community. And child labor that affects education of boys aged between 5 to 11 years is 68% and 12 to 14 years is 80% respectively. So now, if we, the next please. With these kinds of community data, what we, we are doing with this data? We are engaging with the different government agencies and um, department so that we can reach those government agencies to, uh, to make them clear that as we have the evidence that how, how, how what is the data gap between the national data and the community data. And uh, we are also sharing all this information with the national CSOs. In Bangladesh, we, Kapping Foundation, the Bangladesh Indigenous Peoples Forum, we are the part of Citizens Platform for SDGs. This is the uh, more than 80 CSOs that the member of this platform. So we regularly shared our this type of findings with this uh, large number of CSOs about the uh, situation of indigenous people and, and uh, at the same time we are also working with the national human rights organization so that they can also uh, advocate from their perspective and those uh, advocacy initiatives and efforts are reflected in different uh, reports periodic reports and thematic reports of national human rights commission and we are also uh, sharing all these things different uh, regional and global level forums where people came to know about the facts and figures of uh, uh, SDGs implementation status of a particular country as like Bangladesh. So now I would like to share some of the success about through this uh, uh, engagement or to, by using all this uh, data information. At the very beginning we are engaging, trying to engage with Bangladesh, different agencies of Bangladesh government, and with the repeated our engagement with Bangladesh Bureau of Statistics, finally they agreed. Now Bangladesh government is preparing themselves for uh, for their next national census. We'll have our national census in 2000, 2021. So we, as we are advocating with the BBS. Now they agreed to include, uh, previously there was no desegregated data, now they are including the ethnicity-wise information. So from the next uh, census, they, we are getting information on ethnicity. So this is the uh, development uh, from, the, our, from our engagement. And also, previously, our indigenous groups were not uh, recognized by the by the government, but as we are engaged with government and repeatedly uh, demand, raising our demands, and finally, last 23rd, 23rd very recently, uh, government uh, recognized 50 indigenous groups through their gazette notification, but not as the indigenous, but as small ethnic groups. And also another thing is, right now we are having seven, seven five-year plan, and Bangladesh government is um, now on the, their way to uh, formation of the eight five-year plan. And the concern ministry, I mean the planning ministry already contacted with us. They want to, uh, they want to incorporate some of our, uh, use some of our information for planning the eight five-year plan for indigenous people. So if we engage together, we work together, we are very hopeful that we can use and influence our government to come forward to make our uh, make development plan so that we indigenous people will, will no longer be left behind in the implementation of the SDGs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pelab. Thank you for showing us what the data shows in terms of education and employment, a rather bleak picture, I think, but then also for ending up with the success stories to actually show what your advocacy and your dialogue with the government is achieving. 
I think that's quite impressive. We're now turning to the Philippines, to Robbie. Um, the Philippines is, a, as we know, especially a harsh regime. So the question is, of course, how can we use the indigenous navigator there? Over to you. Um, thank you, Julie. I have. Okay, the Indigenous Navigator Initiative in the Philippines is being implemented by Tebtaba Foundation in partnership with Indigenous political institutions and Indigenous people's organizations. So um, I'm part of the team assisting our communities and our political institutions going through this process. Um, next. Now, just to give you an overview in terms of uh, population, the overall population of indigenous peoples in the Philippines, it's around um, 104 million. According to the 2017 national population, it's 12 to 17 percent of the total population. Now, in our, uh, there, there, there is an ethnicity variable in, in, with our national um, census commission when they uh, gather data on population, but how it was implemented in 2017, in 2012 and 2017 was quite weak because the enumerators who were gathering the data did not have much uh, experience and information on how to gather ethnicity. So there's still, the number may still, will still be higher if uh, the ethnicity variable is really uh, implemented well. Now, um, we are distributed in different parts of the country. 61% are in the southern part of the Philippines in Mindanao. 33% are in our region, in the Cordillera Administrative Region, and the rest of the 6% are distributed in, other, uh, in the different parts of um, the country. Now the data on the left side is the data on our ancestral domains in relation to its uh, legal recognition by our National Commission on Indigenous Peoples. If you could see there, um, only a small percentage of our ancestral domain has been given really legal recognition, which I will be presenting in details uh, in the next slide. Now, um, just to show where we are, working in the Philippines, the ones in purple, that's where the, those are the communities that we are working with. So we are working with the Hanunu Omangyans in Mansalay Oriental, Mindoro, the Tagbanwa Indigenous Peoples in Puerto Princesa, Palawan, uh, the Dumagat Indigenous Peoples in Polillo Island, uh, Manobo Indigenous Peoples in Bunawan, Agusan del Sur, Mandaya Indigenous Peoples in Dabao Oriental, Erumanan de Manuvo in Cotabato, and the Tedura and Lambangian indigenous peoples in South Upi and Upi Maguindanao. If you see there, we are working more in Mindanao because if, uh, if, if you see the map that's there now, a lot, of, um, a lot of economic interests are being implemented in that part of uh, the country. And you would see there on the right side, the military deployment in Mindanao is very high with uh, 74, 74 battalions of uh, military forces deployed there. Also because Mindanao is uh, still under mar extended martial law uh, that was declared by our government. Now, in, um, on mining in particular, 230 of the 447 mining applications are in ancestral domains. The colors are not quite clear, but the ones in red are the mining areas in ancestral domains of indigenous peoples. Uh, that's covering around 542,245 hectares of ancestral lands. Now, in terms of the recognition of our collective, collective rights, we do have like legal recognition. We have the Indigenous Peoples Rights Act, and uh, it's the National Commission on Indigenous Peoples who is implementing that. But on the ground, when we were, when the communities were doing data gathering, data is coming out that uh, even with local government agencies, they they have they have uh, low information on the Indigenous Peoples Rights Act, and there is also this uh, refusal to recognize uh, Indigenous Peoples Rights at, at the local level, and even 
non-indigenous peoples in the area, the mainstream population, have that kind of attitude of non-recognition and discrimination against indigenous peoples. And this is a common trend in all of the areas that we are working with. Um, a key, um, key data that's also coming out from our areas is a violation to the free prior and informed consent that's part of our Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act, where go um, governments and private uh, companies, if they're going to in, uh, implement projects and activities in indigenous peoples' territories, they have to acquire our free prior and informed consent. But most of the time, it's being manipulated or it's not implemented. In the case, for example, of the uh, Honanuo uh, Mangyan in Mindoro, the government um, is, is wanting to establish a tourism site in the sacred mountain of the Honanuo Mangyan. And they are doing this, they are already building roads, they are already building structures in that mountain without free prior and informed consent of indigenous peoples. And this is one of our advocacy points right now in the area where we are uh, supporting the community in uh, conducting lobby and dialogue with the government to conduct free prior and informed consent with the Hanunu Amangyan of uh, Mansale Oriental Mindoro. Now, um, I would also like to highlight the case of the Eruman and the Manubo in North Cotabato because uh, the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region of Muslim Mindanao uh, is already established and they've been annexed as part of the uh, as part of that region without their free prior and informed consent. Um, we've been through the Indigenous Navigator Initiative. We've been supporting them in conducting advocacy activities uh, up to the national government to assert, to demand the government to impl implement the free prior and informed consent of Indigenous peoples in the, in the area because they don't want to be part of that uh, of the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region of Muslim Mindanao, but they've been forcefully annexed without their... Um, free prior and informed consent. Um, there is also the expropriation of ancestral lands for plantation and, to, and tourism. In the case of the Tagbanwa in Puerto Princesa, Palawan, because they are in a coastal area, a lot of uh, private individuals and companies have been purchasing their, their coastal areas to develop them into beach, uh, um, beach sites where tourists can, can go to. Now, the problem here is they have, a, uh, they have a certificate of ancestral domain title that's pending with the National Commission of Indigenous Peoples. And until now, it's not being issued because of problems uh, that we are encountering in, in the government um, processes. And then, again in, again, in Palawan, the requirement for resource use permit, where we have to get a permit from the government to be able to gather our resources like the Alma Cigarettes in, in um, Palawan. Now just to say also that um, the recognition of our land rights has been quite slow in that we are required to get titles so that the government and, and the mainstream population will recognize that we have land rights. And there's 206 um, certificate of ancestral domain titles approved as of 2012 by the National Commission of Indigenous Peoples, but only 43 are registered with our registry of deeds. So it's, it's quite a long and slow process in the government of really recognizing our land rights. Next, please. Now, on top of on top of mining, on top of tourism, on top of dams, issue on dams, on top of the FPIC violations, we are also facing a number of cases of human rights violations. This is the national data where there's 54 victims of extrajudicial killings in this current administration, 182 victims of illegal arrest and uh, detention, 67 incidents of forced evacuation of indigenous communities, affecting a total of 38,841 indigenous peoples, 17 incidents of aerial bombings. Now most of these, for example, the forced evacuation, the illegal arrest and detention, and extrajudicial killings are happening in Mindanao. Those areas marked in red are where those uh, violations have been committed. And if you see down south, 
it's really all red. So, and, and if, if you compare it to the earlier map, there's 74 battalions of uh, military also in that area, and there's a lot of projects that be, that's being implemented there. Now, there were also um, documented cases of forced evacuation among the Hanunu Omangyan in Oriental Mindoro and in Upi Maguindanao because of the infighting between armed groups and the state uh, forces. There's a case of arrest and detention for practicing traditional livelihood in Mindoro where they used to do that, but then the government suddenly arrested these two farmers for cutting a coconut, for cutting a coconut tree. And until now, they're in jail for practicing their traditional livelihood in their own ancestral domain. And then the threats and harassment of indigenous peoples. One of our um, indigenous leaders from Upi Maguindanao had to seek sanctuary last year because that, that was the height of the negotiations for the Bangsamoro Autonomous uh, Region. And he, he had critical views on that, and they were, uh, they were already threatening him, so he had to get out of the community. Next. Now, in this, in this process, an indigenous navigator has been contributing to uh, community empowerment and youth and women empowerment. Um, it's the community who's gathering the data. So that's why if you notice, Philippines only had three <laughs> in, in the global portal. But it's been a learning process. It's been an empowering process for the communities where they were able to see their situation and they were able to reflect on, uh, for example, the weakening indigenous political systems that they have. So it was a learning process. It's a reflection process. And it's also an empowering process for them to know and learn about their um, rights. Now for the youth and women, the, most of the data gathering team that we've involved are youth and, and women and it's also been an enriching experience for them to be part of this uh, initiative. The navigator is also uh, supporting and strengthening indigenous political institutions and organizations because alongside the conduct of data gathering is also capacity building activities on finance management, organizational management, uh, leadership trainings for our indigenous leaders because we need to do that for them to be able to advocate effectively for their rights and issues. Uh, for the, we will be implementing in the coming months, we will be implementing some pilot projects and this will be supporting traditional livelihoods of, of indigenous peoples. And just last two points. Uh, the data that's been gathered is also helping them update their strategic plans, the strategic plans of indigenous political institutions and their ancestral domain sustainable development plans. And at the national level, we are partnering with the Commission on Human Rights in their Human Rights Observatory. It's also a database similar to the indigenous navigator that's monitoring the implementation of uh, human rights. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, so, thank you so much, Robbie. Um, it's a terrible situation in the Philippines where the threats, uh, arrest, uh, intimidation, and even the killing that is appearing. And yet, what we hear is also is that the Indigenous Navigator Initiative is a positive aspect within that setting of empowering Indigenous peoples, especially the women and the youth, and in forging uh, partnerships. So thank you very much. We swiftly move on to the next speaker. That's Cameron from Kenya that's going to tell us a little bit about when we talk about the indigenous navigator and the climate situation in Kenya and elsewhere. But while we're talking about Kenya, what uh, use um, do we have of the indigenous navigator? Thank you very much. And uh, I hope with the rich and dynamic data, we still have people engaging with us in the room. So um, Kenya is one of the pilot countries with the indigenous navigator. And um, the focus in Kenya is mostly pastoral communities and a little bit of the Handa Gathra communities, a section of the Ogiek. And so the indigenous navigator, as has been said, is data, gathering data on indigenous people, by indigenous people, for indigenous people. So the idea of indigenous people bringing what is important from their own cosmovisions and, 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 and perspectives. And so if most of our communities are pastoralists, we need to understand the context of the context in which pastoralism is practiced. First of all, 
First release are people of nature, people of the land, people of water and pasture and, 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 and clouds. So their lives is really very climate sensitive. Uh, second, the landscape in which pastoralists are found are always marginal, already peripheral, the so-called arid and semi-arid lands, where water is already scarce, for example, and marginal in the sense of policy and inclusion into development planning by the national government. So you can imagine then what climate uh, does uh, in complicating the already uh, sorry situation that they find themselves in. So in looking at, the, while there were many domains on which we collected data, next please, um, and next again. So um, these are the sites in Kenya. We had six sites, uh, mostly, uh, so the green, the green colored parts are Naro County and Kajiado County. We have two implementing partners, um, PIDO, uh, which my colleague Olesmel seated there is uh, representing an ILEPA. So two indigenous people organizations doing this. And so with respect to climate change, there are three indicators in the SDG uh, framework. One of them is on awareness about climate change issues. And in all these indicators, the, in all the six project sites, there is very low level of awareness on concepts, processes, and interventions programs around climate change. The second indicator is about access to climate change financing. There is hardly any uh, climate intervention supported to build resiliency of indigenous peoples in these communities. The third indicator is capacity to respond to the challenge of climate change and the data generated from this community also indicates really very, very minimal capacities, if any, uh, at least built externally other than the indigenous uh, systems themselves struggling. Next, please. So one of the areas in which um, the climate ch uh, change is evidence in the issue of access to water. And next, please. Now, uh, water is critical in, 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 in utilizing pasture in the pastoral context. So even if you have pasture and you don't have water, then that pasture is not accessible. The livestock will move to find where there is water and, and some little more pasture. Uh, second, of course, is a critical link between uh, water and food security. So if livestock are, are dying, like for example, from December last year to until we came here, there were no rains in these sites. Only three th days ago, we were told there were some light showers. And so these are very, very, uh, as, and this was meant to be the long season beginning uh, February. So, and the rains did not come. And so uh, the photos I showed earlier is a link, of course, between the problem of climate change and encroachment into the Maasai Mao forest, which feeds this landscape. And encroachment is not by indigenous people, it's by other Kenyan who are mostly agricultural communities. And for the first time in the history of this landscape, three of the main rivers emanating from the Maasai Mao dried up. So it's really, really, really a dire situation. The other impact uh, that we saw gathering data is a disruption of indigenous knowledge systems. Uh, these communities for years have occupied this environment which are in this equilibrium and they have managed intergenerationally to observe and, do, and, 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 and uh, arrive at trends which they, are, they, they used to manage their livestock. For this season, this is distorted. So certainly, the challenge of climate change, and in particular related to access to water, is a real, real situation facing and challenging these communities. But what is the place of the indigenous navigator uh, on all this? So like we've seen in the other countries, one of the, I think, the gains and the important value of the indigenous navigator is that indigenous communities now have documented uh, evidences of their position and perspectives and the challenges they are going in. As we all know, government is blind to oral knowledge or, or, or deaf. It understands text. And so we are able to facilitate 
uh, documentation of these positions so that communities can have something they can engage their county governments with and the, and the national government. And so we try to link this data to potential response spaces. One of them is uh, processes related to climate change planning and financing, both at the county level, which is a devolved government level, and the national government. At the county level in Kenya, we have what is called a county integrated development plan, which is a five-year development plan upon which resources are, are, are put in to bring about uh, the desired change. So, and, and incidentally or coincidentally for us, the five-year cycle coincided with this data, and we managed to push in some of this data that we generated on climate change into the Narok and the Kajiado County Integrated Development Plans. It also coincided with a review of the National Climate Change Action Plan for the country. And also we had a chance to input this into the National Climate Change Action Plan. Third, also, uh, Kenya has, has really had a lot of challenges starting red readiness. And as luck would have it, again, uh, this time the funds that came from the World Bank to UNDP, readiness is just being rolled out. So it was also an opportunity to input this data into the national red readiness process and also shape the safeguard information system associated uh, to it. We've also had a chance to engage with a pastoralist parliamentary group, which has also some devolved funds called the Constituency Development Fund to try and prioritize issues of climate change uh, to be financed uh, through these funds. And finally, please uh, move on. Uh, of course, the, I forgot to mention the link between, uh, back between water. So you have both extremes. Now I'm told three days ago it rained and the road to our community is cut by floods. So you have both extremes. And uh, there is a school, there is a small hut you can't see in the middle of that flood. There is a small hut, Maasai hut, you can't tell it. It's submerged. And, and the issues of health now also associated to this flooding and climate change become a serious issue of concern. Next. This is a link between, of course, uh, drought and livestock. And this community rely on livestock. And most of them die at the onset of rain because their dry pasture is swept away before the fresh one emerges. Next. And then, of course, we have heightened conflict again because of this water scarcity and natural resources associated with the uh, climate change stress. Next. Next. And so uh, what are we doing? So one of the components that was mentioned here about the indigenous navigator is a small project grant for these communities. And, and one of the things they prioritize related to climate change is actually water. And on the, on the right there, we have a water pan, which we manage to desilt uh, during this process by triggering funds from a local partner and the county government and also we've been having ongoing hay to ensure pasture is available across the season down next and uh, so how do we then come up with diversified livelihood systems that uh, are going to be sustained in the context of these difficult circumstances of climate change so you have honey making beads for women, and I should thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kimaran. And of course, we all know the climate changes are here, and we are all affected by it, but we also know that those who are most affected by it are indigenous peoples, and yet the data from Kenya shows that they don't have access to climate financing, and they don't have the capacity to respond. But I also think that you, uh, you really very clearly show that uh, in we know that it's not just the government of, of, of Kenya that is blind to oral nor knowledge. We need the uh, hard data, and this is what has come out of the Navigator, and you've been able to engage with the authorities yeah. and, and getting your priorities into the, to the plants, various forms of plants. I think that's very impressive. So thank you very much. Let's move on to Xavion from uh, Peru. And if you need translation, you now need to put on the, the gear. Um, I've asked uh, Shabion to, to talk to us a little bit about uh, how the Navigator data has been useful in empowering the local communities. And, and also, as you've heard, we have these small projects as part of the whole initiative. 
uh, in what way uh, the projects can help reducing the huge inequalities we see in Peru. Over to you. Bueno, okay, sorry, just one more. I've just been asked to say again that do you all have the channel? If you need English, it's five and French is one. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Chapeo Nonengo. Soy de la Nación One Piece, Perú. Hasta el año fines de 2015, eh, nosotros denominábamos eh, Pueblo One Piece. Pero por, con decisión propia y autónoma, eh, desde noviembre de 2015, nos, hemos, nos estamos denominando eh, Nación One Piece, con la creación del gobierno territorial autónomo de la Nación One Piece, que actualmente es nuestra institución. Dicho esto, y, y efectivamente este, en Perú los, los One Piece, la Nación One Piece, también somos parte beneficiario del proyecto de navegador indígena, Y la pregunta inicial que hago es también, este, digo, ¿por qué los europeos eh, están interesados o se interesan en los derechos humanos, derechos colectivos de los pueblos indígenas? Si, si alguien me puede responder más tarde, sería bueno. Sin embargo, estamos muy agradecidos a... Um, este proyecto navegador que vino a través de la OIT, ahí está el doctor al frente mío, eh, y Uguía también está presente, que está promoviendo este evento. Precisamente en uso de los fondos que nos dispusieron, eh, si no me equivoco, año 2016, hemos aplicado dos encuestas, eh, uno, estructura de encuesta local dirigido a las comunidades, y otro nacional dirigido a las comunidades, pero el, para un poco diagnosticar el, la situación de los derechos humanos eh, a nivel nacional. A nosotros nos ha interesado porque efectivamente sabemos que los gobiernos nacional, regional y locales no tienen mucho conocimiento tienen poco conocimiento respecto a los derechos humanos, los pueblos indígenas, eh, derechos colectivos, especialmente los instrumentos como la Convención de la OIT, eh, la Declaración de las Naciones Unidas, y, y inclusive la, la normativa nacional. ¿no? Y entonces este, este proyecto nos ha caído, digamos, de, de la mano y hemos podido aplicar... Eh, en nuestras comunidades. Nosotros estamos en dos regiones, región Loreto, que es 100% amazónica, y eh, región Amazonas, que es una parte Amazonía, otra parte alta, ¿no? selva alta, y somos aproximadamente 15.300 habitantes de estas dos, dos cuencas, ¿no?, Nos hemos aplicado en, primero un grupo de comunidades a, a, en nuestro pueblo, luego en un evento grande eh, que llamamos Cumbres, precisamente donde nació el, el gobierno territorial autónomo, hemos podido socializar los resultados parciales de la encuesta. Y entonces hemos... Eh, de mutuo debate, digamos, debates eh, colectivo con la gente, con los delegados y sabios, hombres y mujeres, en dicho evento, eh, hemos ido discutiendo ítem por ítem, pregunta por pregunta, debates, por qué esto nos afecta así, esto no, eh, cómo está nuestro idioma, cómo están los alcaldes este, de las dos cuencas, cómo está el gobierno regional, etcétera, en fin... Fue un debate interesante y hemos aprobado por consenso la, la encuesta que está disponible o va a estar disponible. Como parte de, del proceso de debates, de acuerdo a la estructura de las encuestas, las encuestas por supuesto está dirigido a averiguar si los gobiernos nacional, regional o local están implementando los, los objetivos ODS, ¿no?, 
están implementando la convención 169, están implementando eh, la declaración de la ONU sobre los derechos de los pueblos indígenas. Entonces, resulta que eh, en el debate y en, como resultado sabemos que eh, ningún, ninguno de los niveles de gobierno, ni nacional, ni regional, menos los locales, están implementando estos instrumentos debidamente. Es así que el año pasado, el 2017, hemos hecho este otro diagnóstico para saber cómo estaba este famoso plan nacional para implementar las ODS, ¿no es cierto? Y ustedes saben que el plan nacional es compromiso de todos los gobiernos del mundo para implementar el, la, los, los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. Resulta que este, el sector encargado eh, no, lo, no lo tenía, el, 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 los funcionarios no lo conocen, el, los gobiernos regionales, menos los gobiernos este, locales. Así que ese es un reto para la nación Ampis y por supuesto para los gobiernos locales. En el sentido, ¿por qué consideramos como reto? Nosotros entendemos que si la gente, si la población, si los ciudadanos, nosotros, los beneficiarios de estos instrumentos, no conocemos, no sabemos, entonces no podemos o no tenemos esa capacidad de influir, de exigir que se cumplan esos, esos derechos consignados en distintos instrumentos. Entonces, primer punto es que nosotros hemos decidido eh, formar un grupo, de, eh, un grupo de talentos humanos propios, eh, no una capacitación, sino una formación. Y por eso es que este año, y eh, por supuesto que este, como consecuencia del primer proyecto, eh, nos han aprobado eh, dos proyectos pilotos. Uno de ellos es precisamente para atacar esta deficiencia, este vacío eh, de conocimientos de parte de los eh, gobiernos, distintos niveles, y también de la Nación One Peace. En este sentido, este año estamos eh, promoviendo la formación de talentos humanos en estos puntos, en el conocimiento de, de los derechos consignados en el convenio 169, la declaración y este, ODS. ¿Cuál es la finalidad de la capacitación? Nosotros estamos llamando formación de, eh, de líderes, formación de líderes, una escuela que estamos llamando Escuela de Líderes Sharian. Sharian es uno de los líderes eh, eh, que defendió mucho los territorios, sus derechos colectivos y es famoso en nuestro mundo y por eso, por no olvidar su nombre, pues este, hemos, hemos puesto este nombre de la escuela con este proyecto aprobado eh, para estos años. Entonces, en estos momentos eh, o este año, eh, estamos iniciando la formación de estos grupos humanos eh, que incluye digamos la legislación eh, sobre eh, gobiernos locales eh, sobre las municipalidades incluyendo la constitución y acuerdos y avances políticos de las Naciones Unidas y otros instrumentos ¿no? que sirven para que nos sirven para eh, conocer ampliamente y influir en los gobiernos locales. Nosotros estamos decididos a influir fuertemente hacia los gobiernos locales en el sentido de que eh, vayamos fomentando nuestras propias capacidades locales a través de este grupo humano formado, vamos a tener eh, al final del proyecto una instancia, una especie de entidad, no quizás una organización, pero un grupo humano que, se, que vamos a llamar este, um, observatorio legal. Este observatorio legal consiste en que, dado que los gobiernos locales especialmente no tienen conocimiento 
amplio sobre los derechos colectivos y por tanto los funcionarios que vienen de la ciudad se sienten en nuestro territorio y no los implementan nuestros derechos colectivos, no los implementa, eh, digamos, la, no lo aplican los, estos derechos consignados en el convenio, en la constitución, en la declaración. Entonces, este grupo humano, la, la función principal de este grupo humano va a ser que, eh, primero, tenemos que suscribir un convenio marco con, con el gobierno local, de las dos cuencas. Luego, este, y eso para que nos permita, según la norma, ¿no? que nos permita asistir en sus sesiones de consejos municipales. Y eso dice la ley. La ley permite eso, pero no lo están implementando. Y entonces vamos a aplicar esa normativa y estos muchachos ya formados van a sentarse un poco como hacer seguimiento de los procesos de implementación de los derechos de los pueblos indígenas en esas dos municipalidades. Con ese resultado del seguimiento, los muchachos cada mínimo, cada dos, dos veces al año, van a venir a informar en un pleno, en un debate, eh, en las cumbres, en las asambleas, informar cuál es el avance de la gestión de uno de, de las municipalidades. El pueblo va a debatir, va a llamar a los funcionarios, al alcalde mismo, ¿no? y decir, señor alcalde, usted en este punto estás fallando, en este punto estás bien, en este punto estás fallando. ¿No? El tema de, de contrataciones, de construcciones, de infraestructura, el tema de desarrollo humano, desarrollo económico. ¿Cómo anda? O sea, ¿cuál es la gestión? La idea aquí es este, apoyar a los alcaldes a mejorar su, su gestión cada día, de manera progresiva. De manera que eh, al final, de result como resultado sea eh, que los alcaldes haga una buena gestión, gestión de calidad favorable en todos los aspectos, en, eh, que nos to en todos los aspectos de la vida. ¿no? ¿Por qué en estos dos distritos o dos gobiernos la mayoría de la población somos el 90% los vampis? ¿No es cierto? Así que tenemos todo ese derecho para exigir a los gobiernos locales que se implemente debidamente eh, los derechos consignados, los instrumentos que ya mencioné. Y esa es la finalidad. Y por eso, este, dado que tiempo ya nos ganó, eh, eso es lo que estamos haciendo eh, gracias a este proyecto y quisiéramos, vamos a continuar implementando este proyecto. Gracias. Thank you so much, Sapion, for also for showing us a country like Peru that's ratified the right conventions, uh, doing the national uh, plans for the SDGs. There's still a big uh, gap in terms of local authorities, knowledge of indigenous people's rights, but also of uh, the communities themselves and how the indigenous navigator has helped to uh, build that knowledge uh, and, um, and empowerment. Uh, and we are very much looking forward to following the School of Leadership to see what uh, comes out of, of that project. Now, um, we have 20 minutes left, which means we do have a little bit of time for questions uh, from you, the participants here. So, uh, time to raise your hands, put a question. And I should say, while you're thinking, I could just keep talking, I should say that I need to repeat your questions question for the interpreter, which means make it short, because otherwise I'm not going to get it. Yes? Yes, you in the green jacket. Yeah. 
gap in terms of um, developing uh, policy sports on the people. And uh, in Australia, the Australian group exploits a lot of the same data data on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So um, I'm curious how these tools would sort of work in both settings where you have statistics agencies that are collecting relevant data and uh, other countries where they might not be. Um, okay, so uh, we have two questions here. One is, uh, data collected by the national statistics bureaus, how do we as the indigenous navigator in the various countries relate to that? And the other question was related to the national human uh, rights institution, what is it exactly we've been engaging with, with them that was mentioned in the beginning? Perhaps, Joanne, do you want to start with the last question? Yes. On the national yes. no. Yeah, um, the, the one that's actually leading the engagement with the national human rights institutions is the Danish Institute for Human Rights, who did the trainings. And there are at different levels of how they have committed to or use the data. One, one is uh, some have committed that they will assist in data gathering. Uh, some is more on, on the use of data. But most are actually that the, the instruments, no? the, the human rights instruments relating to indigenous peoples is rather something new to them, like the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So that they're now integrating those in their monitoring work. And in, in cases where they meet uh, cases of human, of human rights violations of indigenous peoples, then they submit that also to human rights, uh, to indigenous human rights organizations or, and, 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 and take action on, on those cases. So that's uh, how far I, uh, I know. Uh, but they are also compiling, uh, preparing uh, specific reports. Uh, for example, the case of uh, uh, in, uh, in the, uh, National Human Rights Institution in, in Malaysia, Thailand, and uh, Indonesia. So, uh, so it's more really making sure that indigenous peoples are integrated in their work using the navigator. And I would definitely encourage you to, um, to um um, take up communication with the Danish Institute for Human Rights that are not present here today, but they can tell you much more and we can give you the details afterwards. So the issue about the National Bureaus of Statistics, we heard from Palab that you've been uh, uh, quite successful in, in pushing them to, uh, uh, to have disaggregated data by ethnicity. Just before you get to explain a little bit more about that, then perhaps I just want to ask some of the other panelists whether you have had any engagement with your statistics bureaus. Yes, if you have. Um, on the statistics, it's quite difficult to really get the actual population of indigenous peoples in the communities that we are working with. Also because of the, uh, the methodology that we've been using, it's really focus group discussion, but we are interacting with our Philippine Statistics Authority for our data gatherers to be part of the enumerators when the next census will be done in the Philippines. Now, on the Commission on Human Rights and the National Human Rights Institution, our Commission on Human Rights is studied the Indigenous Navigator questionnaire and the guide, no? And they integrated some points of uh, the Indigenous Navigator tool into their human rights observatory on how they're going to collect data on indigenous people. So that's one concrete example on how national human rights institutions have used the indigenous navigator tool. So that's now part of the human rights observatory and they're testing it now on how uh, in, in actual sense they're going to collect the data using some of the tools and questionnaires that they've adapted from our indigenous navigator framework. Thank you. I think this um two very, very critical questions because these are the spaces which government looks for data to make decisions. And I think for the National Human Rights Institution, it's two-way. It's a two-way process. For example, in the Kenyan context, the National Human Rights Commission is developing a national action plan for business and human rights. And knowing that there is a tool from the ground on indigenous issues, then they, they reach out to us to feed into this. Uh, second, they, they have been part of the group that filled the national questionnaire, the scooping study, because generally I think they are more familiar in the national space maybe than, than, than some of us. So I think the, the 
tool is as successful to the extent that this institution take over and, 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 and take as a valid space and tool to re get reliable concrete data. Second, on the Bureau for Kenya, we were told, and this is a lesson we learn later, that we should have subjected the tools and the methodologies to them at the start of the project so that they will be anticipating and they can even put, uh, provide some inputs on how to adjust the tool so that it can also, or at least enrich, then they'll be anticipating data to come from, from, from the tool. So I think the navigator must engage these two institutions for meaningful uptake of this data. Shapio, do you have any experiences on this you want to share before or? Bueno, este, lastimosamente mi experiencia en este campo de cómo el Estado, las instituciones estatales o paraestatales o y una institución privada respecto a derechos humanos pueden utilizar los resultados, eh, les, les digo que no. Hemos buscado a varias instituciones, incluyendo las propias instituciones indígenas que tenemos en Perú, eh, por el momento, ni la Defensoría, ni la Comisión de Derechos Humanos que está en Perú eh, han tenido esa, digamos, capacidad de eh, utilizar estos, estos resultados. Así que para nuestro país es algo negativo. Eh, yo sé que la estadística en los países este, africanos es importante, sobre todo los pueblos indígenas de ese, de ese continente. Sin embargo, este, las estadísticas, en mi caso, en nuestro caso Perú, no influyen mucho en la situación real de los pueblos indígenas. Así que muchas veces tenemos que protestar, tenemos que hacer muchas gestiones para hacer prevalecer nuestros derechos colectivos. De modo que eh, este es otro reto de cómo vamos a convencer en el futuro a, al Estado y a, los, a las instituciones de derechos humanos para que eh, puedan utilizar y hacer válidos los resultados, ¿no? Eso es, eso es todo. Okay, thank you. So we have very, very different experiences, but one of the positive experiences is one you know of, Palap. So yes. please give us a short account of that. Uh, <coughs> regarding the engagement with the National Bureau of Statistics in Bangladesh, uh, when we contacted with them and we explained about the navigator data and uh, First of all, they appreciated us, and they said, we don't have any uh, disagreement data or ethnicity. Uh, we only, Bangladesh government uh, right now, they have the data uh, based on religious, religion. So how, how many people are Christianity, how many people are Muslim, how many people practice Buddhism? We have that data, but we don't have data by ethnicity. That's why when they heard that we are trying to generate some of the uh, community data, they appreciated it. And, but, however, for getting their uh, approval or some kind of recognition, they have certain procedures that, that we need to go through. But for the time being, they say, uh, as they are um, uh, including some of the questions in, in the, uh, related to indigenous people and I think minorities in their national census, However, they are very interested to produce another, uh, to conduct another survey, which uh, they, 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 they say is household survey for only for indigenous people, so that we can know about the socioeconomic condition of indigenous people, or, or, or unemployment ratio, poverty ratio, all these things. But for that, they, they ask us to find out some fund, because Bangladesh government right now, they don't have dedicated fund for conducting another survey or household survey for indigenous people. So that they say if we can manage fund from, from different donor agencies, they are ready to provide their technologies. They are ready to provide their human resources. So uh, it was also very positive things that if we can generate some fund and here, 
European Union is here. <laughs> ILO is here. If they come for forward, then we can easily generate a request Bangladesh Bureau of Statistics. To call for funding here. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, we do have a little bit of time for a few more questions, especially if you make it short, and especially if you would tell me who you would like to post the question to. Oh, we don't have any more questions. Oh, we do have one. So even though we claim to speak in our own language, how many foreign languages? In the national or in the community? Yes. So it's, it's like a mixture of languages. And how do we then measure that in the, in the questionnaire? Okay, that's a good uh, question, but Joanne has yeah. the answer. Excellent. Yeah. No, uh, the, the, the question is more directed on the indigenous language, on how people are, are uh, still able to speak their language, but it does not provide for comparative to other data, uh, other languages. So basically it's the indigenous peoples themselves assessing their language when they, yeah, yeah when they, uh, reply to the to the survey if there are no more questions there is one question from the Norwegian Institute of Human Rights Australia slash Australia yes <laughs> go ahead <laughs> Yes, I think this is a very good question and something we've discussed a lot because this is basically about security. I mean, it is the indi no, no, I'm answering the question. I shouldn't be sorry. <laughs> no, I will. I am supposed to repeat. Yes, thank you. I just got confused with my role here. So the question is around data collection, and especially Sami communities have been uh, concerned uh, about the abuse of data collection. And whether we have an issue in this initiative about data being collected based on ethnicity and the possible abuse uh, of, of that data. Good question. I'm not going to answer it. I'm going to. And a book, Indigenous Data Sovereignty, that we could all uh, read if we want to. But thank you. So who would like to answer that? Joanne wants to. Yeah, uh, the, we're pretty much aware on that. So uh, uh, there's always the, the consent. That's uh, one of the basic questions that's been asked for communities. If uh, uh, one is to get the consent on the data, and second is a consent whether they want to keep the data for themselves or to share the data. So th because the, the data can also be gathered, but it will not be shared. So that is for them to, de to decide. And if it's going to be shared, of what will be shared and what not to be shared. That's another layer. And third is the identification of the source of data, whether they want that to be public or to make it confidential. So those are the layers of sort of security in, in, in terms of the, of, of the data. But it's very much part also of the free prior informed consent. Those will be the last words. We have to finish at three. Um, Sorry, Robbie. Um, and uh, we have Martin from the ILO and uh, Tove from the EU to give the final closing comments. So 
Martin, I ask you to uh, sure. to just summarize two achievements of these initiatives and two <laughs> challenges. Maybe you want to start the other way around, but, yes, but um, yeah, you have a few minutes. Certainly, the ILO would not like to have the last word uh, <laughs> on such a complex uh, partnership and collaboration over a, a little while now, and uh, it's it's a pleasure to see each time really this evolving and. Um, the, how, how the way we are using uh, this tool is diversifying um, and, and maturing in many ways. Um, it will be difficult to try to summarize, and that I think is not my role. But I will just say maybe two, two things, no? Because um, uh, first of all, I think the Indonesian Navigator has helped to make things that are invisible visible, and by doing so has contributed to make processes more transformative because changing social realities, social behaviors uh, that are very entrenched, like discrimination and exclusion, uh, this requires uh, imagination and innovation. And I think uh, what some of our colleagues have said here and friends uh, is showing that the tool of the Navigator has helped them to be very smart um, uh, on, and maneuver around this issue and show really how indigenous themselves can be very competent and, uh, and, and skillful negotiators and diplomats, you know, at the, at the different levels, from the local to the global level, taking things in their hand. You know. I think I want to mention two things, the, 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 the complementarity between indigenous data and official statistics data. You know. uh, obviously, these are completely two different things, and the navigator doesn't collect statistical data that can be used for similar purposes than the national statistical offices, because it's self-selected data. You know. It's a completely different idea. But the mere fact that indigenous peoples are producing data has been pushing some countries in which there is no disregulation to look into these questions, and they have been actually being inspired by some of the methodology that's directly useful for them. So I think uh, this is complementarity. You know, one example here in the ILO, for instance, we are doing, of course, uh, more traditional survey work also, household data, living conditions, working conditions, that's what we do. But uh, we will have now also products that have this more traditional data uh, with some more revolutionary data, I would say, that comes from the uh, indigenous people. So to say, how does the same situation look like from the, from the perspective of indigenous people? So this is also how this is interesting for us as the ILO to be in such a partnership. The second one is, really to see what's on paper and what's in practice. Now let me come to the example of, uh, of prior consultations with indigenous peoples, which is a right that's contained in our convention, but also in the declaration. Uh, a country might have a beautiful law um, that requires consultations with indigenous peoples uh, with a view to reaching agreement or consent on measures that affect them, but in practice this, uh, uh, this consent is never reached. There is never ever an agreement reached in no case. So the navigator does both at the national level say, is there a law? And secondly, how is it applied? Is, is there any case where we have heard there's agreement reached? And if it is not the case, then the right to consultation has not been properly applied. So uh, these are very two con uh, very concrete applications. We, we know all of that, those who work in this, that application and implementation is weak, but we find new ways of making that visible and bringing that into the debates at the various levels um, that we're uh, engaging with stakeholders uh, that are uh, duty bearers. Government unities are duty bearers in, in order to ensure respect for human rights. So I would leave it with that uh, and give it back to you, Julie. Thank you very much, Martin. And now to you, Tove. So is this a data revolution? And, and how do you see the future of such an initiative in advancing indigenous people's rights? I would not really speak about data, but just a few uh, words. Um, where I would like to uh, congratulate you on the pro uh, progress of, with the in Indigenous Navigator. Uh, and uh, there is no doubt that the Indigenous Navigator is an emblematic uh, project uh, for, for the EU, uh, funded on the, the European Democracy for Human Rights and um, Demo uh, Human Rights and Democracy, and also a program called uh, Global Public Goods and Challenges. Uh, EU policies are, uh, ha has two priorities, based, of course, on, on uh, support for the UN DRIP. That is non-discrimination in relation to all human rights, being civil, political, uh, economic, social, and cultural, and also in addressing the threats uh, indigenous peoples experience in relation to land, environment, uh, climate. Uh, and I think what I, what I hear here is that 
these rights, I mean, human rights, is also by linking it to the, to the SDGs, are really made very tangible. And it shows that you can actually progress on them in a, in a pragmatic way. Uh, so in that sense, I, we do believe that indigenous navigator, as you also, all the speakers also said, uh, does not only contribute to empower indigenous peoples themselves, but also to empower civil society organization, non-indigenous civil society organization that you work with, uh, governments, national human rights institutions, and also national statistics bureaus. And in that way, I think it heightened the, the hope of a better recognition and understanding of indigenous people's rights and thus of progress. So thank you. Thank you so much, Tove. Very nice ending on those po positive words. And then I'd like to thank you all for joining us here. And please help me thank you, thanking the panelists here.